going. Okay. Okay, it looks like we're live. But good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And thanks for tuning in to another virtual, virtual event. Uh, we're delighted today to have Hannah Morrissey with us um, the day after the official publication launch for a brand new book, The Widowmaker. And Hannah was kind enough to sign a bunch of them for us. And uh, let's see. yeah, we've got a cool little bookmark as well. So uh, I'll go ahead and put a link if you'd like to order one of the signed copies in the comments field. And if you have questions for Hannah, go ahead and put them in and Barbara will bring me on screen towards the end of the hour. And I'd be happy to ask any of your questions. So Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Hannah, it's very nice to see you again. We can actually, I don't recall that we did um, an event for Hello Transcriber. Did we talk about it? Nope, we didn't. I didn't think so. But you and I did do an event recently, and you were the co-host for another author. Um, yes. And that was really fun. So I'm glad to get to do one for you just all by yourself. Oh, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so where, where is actually here? Where, where is it that you live? Is it in Wisconsin or Michigan? Yeah. My here is like near Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. So the southern, the southern edge. <laughs> And where is Black Harbor, this um, fictional city that you've made up? Yeah, Black Harbor is very much inspired by this area of Wisconsin, um, mostly because I'm so drawn to kind of these, uh, you know, like once industrial titan towns, and then when industry moves out, uh, kind of what they become. And in, in my, you know, universe that I've built, it's like the universe or when, when industry moves out, crime moves in. And right. I really love um, like kind of the area that I live in. It's like near right next to Lake Michigan and Lake Michigan brings all kinds of harsh elements. Like it's very beautiful, but it's also very cold. And I want people to feel cold and like chilled to the bone when they read my books. So I very much lean into the atmosphere. <laughs> Gotcha. Well, I actually grew up on Lake Michigan. I can certainly attest to how cold it was. For Although sure. <laughs> it was a little warmer, I think, um, in Winnetka, which is south. It's in Illinois, south of where you're talking about. Lake yeah, Superior, a little bit. of course, is the seriously cold um, Great Lake. And yes. um, has been featured in any number of crime novels. As uh, Nevada Barr wrote a wonderful book about it. Steve Hamilton wrote an entire series set on the um, Mount Lake Superior. Um, so Ken Kruger's visited it. It's a really amazing body of water. Um, right. Lake Michigan is different, um, mm -hmm. but equally exciting. We're going to take a, a cruise of the Great Lakes next September. I can't believe that in all wow. the years. I know, um, but you know, they've now actually brought um, cruise ships in so that you can, I think our trip goes from Duluth to Toronto. So you have a chance to, you know, not, I wish it had gone from Milwaukee. I think it would have been really interesting. You've got none. Yeah. You may figure out how to go to Milwaukee and take a little boat. <laughs> yeah. Um, that sounds like a really cool tour, actually. <laughs> it does. No, I'm really, I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to yeah. be fascinating. Anyway, um, I bring all that up sort of, you know, rambling on here because Black Harbor appears to be the main character rather than a particular individual in right. two books. So we had a different person in Hello Transcriber, your debut here. Mm -hmm. And then we have a new person in The Widowmaker. Why'd yes. you decide to do that? That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Um, well, I think with Hello Transcriber, um, I mean, at first when I wrote it, it was meant to be just a standalone novel. I wasn't really thinking about a series. Um, so I wrote it as a standalone with the transcriber Hazel as the main character. And I feel like I would love to revisit her, but I'm like, she has to just, she's got to do her own thing for a little bit. Like she's got some stuff to work on and, and some exploring to do. So I'm going to leave her alone. Um, and I, and then when I, you know, I had a two book deal for, um, Hello Transcriber, and then, you know, just book two. So it was, uh, I had a lot of freedom of what I was going to write next and what I was going to come up with. And just like going through the process of writing and editing Hello Transcriber, um, Black Harbor was such a strong character. And it was a character who I wasn't finished with. So 
in Hello Transcriber, we see what we really uh, dial in on for Black Harbor is sort of the nucleus, like the center of the city. And it's very much surrounded by the police department and this bridge that people jump off of because, you know, the town is totally hopeless. So it's very much around like the police department and the bridge in the center of the city. And then in the Widowmaker, I was really fascinated with exploring like the edge by the lake where these there's these, you know, sort of rich has been mansions. So like literally sliding into the lake and disappearing and like what kind of people live over there. And then you have that dichotomy of like the haves and the have nots because there's the wealthy Reynolds family who live on the edge of the lake. And then there's the main character, Morgan, who is very much not from that side of town. You know, she's from the opposite side of the track. So it's it's a very stark contrast, I think, for her. You know, you're not the first person that's done that. I edited a series of books by Thomas Kais in which it was um, set around Greenwich in that part of Connecticut where you have, um, you know, seriously rich people. Right. And, and then you've got, you know, the ordinary people who look after the seriously rich people, which is yeah. in fact true in a lot of communities um, that were that have been either really rich or rapidly gentrified. Crested mm -hmm. Butte in Colorado, we have some property near Gunnison on top of a mountain. It's a long story, so I won't go into it. <laughs> but anyway, I read, I was really interested to see that Crested Butte, which became this enormously expensive ski town, mm -hmm. and it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, right. um, that that people who needed to work there to service um, the skiers and so forth couldn't afford to live there. So mm -hmm. Crested Butte has started buying up some of the uh, resort and chalet property in order to turn it into affordable housing. So <laughs> wow. there would be a community, you know, of, of people who were able to, uh, to work there and keep the town going. And I thought that was really very forward looking of them. Yeah, very much. <laughs> That's really cool. It is cool. So yeah. Rust Belt America, I don't really think of Wisconsin as Rust Belt America. I tend to think of it as more <laughs> like Ohio. Um, but I mean, yeah, is, we have a lot like, of, you know, there's a lot of agriculture and everything around. So it's, it's crazy where I live now. Like I'm not from this area of Wisconsin. I'm from much farther north where it's very um, remote and farmlands. Right. And then down here, you get more of that industry, probably because it's close to the lake. You know, we have like these harbor these harbor side cities. Um, so it's crazy that you can just drive 10 minutes out of town and you're behind a tractor, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, you're right. There is a sort of belt right around the lake yeah. that yep. um, has shipping and is industrial. But Wisconsin, I mean, I always think, you know, when I was a kid, Wisconsin was like the dairy belt. I remember, you're going to love this. I remember the Marjorie War. Do you know anything about the Marjorie War? No. <laughs> okay. Well, Wisconsin was famous for its butter. Actually, still is famous for its butter. It's a very large agricultural product. So when the margin, the margarine manufacturers came along, um, they colored the margarine yellow, mm -hmm. and the Wisconsin butter people were so upset by that and forced them to change it. So when you bought margarine back then, it was white sticks. And in it was a little package of yellow food dye. So if you bought the margarine, you had to open the little package and squirt oh, it over no. your white sticks. But that was Wisconsin fighting to preserve its brand integrity. I mean, yeah. it, you know, I didn't appreciate it at the time. I thought it was ridiculous. But looking yeah. back on it, I can really understand, you know, why the, the farmers, the butter people, so to speak, mm -hmm. were yeah, so intent on, on it. Right. Yeah. And it's ingenious too. And you know, like, you want it dyed, dye it yourself. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, that's how it was for a really long time. And, and Wisconsin was all, I mean, in addition to cheese and butter, if you traveled through parts of Wisconsin, especially Northern Wisconsin, everywhere you went, there was pie. And I'm talking serious <laughs> pie. We are talking banana cream with a, you know, with a whipped cream foaming out of it or lemon meringue that looked like oh, a yeah. cloud. We have one of those. That's one of our like local haunts. Is it? North. Yes. Every time we go to visit family, there's OJ's. It's the best pie in the state. And we're like, I mean, we're not going to contest it. Sure. It's great pie. So. <laughs> wow. OJ, you know, that even sounds faintly familiar. <laughs> I love it. Well, anyway, um, but but I'm interested that there's some industrial Wisconsin, mm -hmm. um, and 
and surely it would be along the lake. Well, Milwaukee has really come along, I think, as more mm -hmm. of an industrial city. Of course, you know, forever it was famous for beer. Oh, it still is. <laughs> right. But, <laughs> but more than that. So anyway, here we have a woman named Hannah. Uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Morgan, Morgan Mori. Mori yeah. is an interesting name because it actually makes you think of, you know, the Latin word for death and so forth. Did you, did yeah. you use it for that reason? Yeah, I liked it for that reason. <laughs> yeah, well, there we go. Um, and so when she, why did she come back to Black Harbor? So, um, yeah, I suppose I should probably give a bit of a synopsis yeah. about the Widowmaker. So we were talking a bit about Hello Transcriber and how, you know, we have our main character, Hazel, who is uh, in, she's dropped in like as a, a transplant to Black Harbor and you're seeing it through her, you know, totally fish out of water, you know, fresh perspectives. And so I wanted to do something completely opposite and then bringing Morgan in for the Widowmaker. Morgan is somebody who's returning home to Black Harbor and, you know, not because she wants to, um, because she has nowhere else to go. So Morgan returns to Black Harbor, like when her life literally goes up in ash and flames and um, she's a photographer, she's a very much down on her luck photographer. And then she gets a gig shooting a Christmas party for the, the wealthy Reynolds family who are, you know, the richest, most well-known family in Black Harbor um, because uh, for the last 20 years, their patriarch Clive Reynolds has disappeared. Um, so, you know, it's uh, rumored that maybe his, his wife killed him or, you know, there's all these rumors of murder and mystery floating around. So now with her camera, Morgan has a backstage pass into this family's lives and the inner workings. And uh, that same night, she happens to witness the murder of a cop and now this murder of a cop, his partner um, is hell bent on finding out what happened and why somebody killed him. But this murder uh, reopens like a new clue to solving this 20 year old cold case. Morgan's caught in the middle of it. And now investigator Hudson is about to see how Morgan perhaps connects to everything. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but you you know what what if I remember right what it's been I have to say it's been a while since I read the book so I may be slightly shaky but as I remember she does such a good job with her initial photography assignment with the family mm -hmm. um, that they ask her to come back and and it's the children isn't it that they want her to um, and I can't remember is it like a was it for the holidays or was it um, kind of a record why is it that they make her kind of the official family photographer. Yeah, she, because um, you, you're totally right. Like she does a good job. They're very happy with her. Um, and then um, the the mother, Eleanor, she would like, you know, her family photos like scanned into the computer and kept as keepsakes. So she has this project for Morgan and Morgan has, you know, literally no other job. And also she's very fascinated by this family and it's a lot of money. So She's very much willing to do it. And then I had fun sort of learning about the Reynolds family through Morgan's pro project. So she's, you know, scanning all of these photos into her computer. She lives, she's back to living in her parents' basement and sort of, I don't know, living a little bit like voyeuristically, I suppose, or almost vicariously through these Reynolds characters who had, you know, a childhood and an, and an upbringing that was very different from her own. So um, it was definitely fun just to kind of play with seeing a family sort of live out their lives like through these old photographs. And of course, being with a camera, you, right. can, freeze, you can freeze moments and you can see things that right. the human eye may not process. So you, you realize that Morgan is going to be an observer um, mm -hmm. in both real time and then also going back through the family photographs, right. which obviously with the missing patriarch at all, a savvy mystery reader will work out. <laughs> but somehow or other, Morgan is going to find clues to right. what, what happened to him. And, you know, you have, you have, it's interesting. You have a really dark streak, don't you? I mean, oh, you're not you. giving any quarter to anybody when you write these books. No, no, I love, I love dark fiction. Um, I think I just have like a natural penchant for it. And it's something that 
my editor and I have, we've worked to like compromise, especially this book, because, you know, I kind of went in, we both went into this book blind, like hello transcriber. She knew what she was getting basically. Um, but with the Widowmaker, she's like, okay, go off. And I, you know, I was left to my own devices for nine or 10 months to write this book. And you know, it got, it got way darker than I had planned on initially. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, my editor, Leslie, had sent me this, you know, the edit memo kind of, or, or just like upon first receiving the manuscript. And then, so I get her email back and she's like, oh, Hannah, the, the writing is lovely. And like, this is great. And I love what you're doing here. And she's like, but it's too dark and it's too weird. So you need to work on that and tone it and tone it down. So we talked about some things and um, she's like, you're going to go all the way this way, dark. She's like, and I'm going to pull you back this way a little bit. And she's like, we have to, you know, you have to have like pinpricks of hope, like throughout the novel and stuff. So Leslie goes, she, she lets me go almost as dark as I can before reeling it back and lightening it up a little bit. Well, you know, she has an excellent point. And I remember mm -hmm. a similar discussion years ago with the writer, who was an actual serving policewoman. Mm -hmm. And the pacing in her book was so relentless. I mean, there was absolutely zero, zero pause in the action and it was exhausting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I remember thinking to myself that somebody should have said to her, you have to have resting places. You do. It was too tiring for the reader. Mm -hmm. You know, I would have thought for her too, um, to just never have any moment of downtime when you can pause and you can think about what happened? What does it mean? Where might it be going? You know, or just catching exactly. your breath. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that would apply equally well if you're really, really dark. Mm -hmm. You're going to send the reader into sort of a spiral, you know? Right. It doesn't. And I, I see that too now. And I, you know, you have to even think about like, what do you like in books as a reader, you know, because sure. writers are all readers and, and some readers are writers. So I think just, you kind of have to like take a step back and be like, what do I like to read about? Or like, what do, what am I happy with when it happens in a book? And so Leslie's very good about reminding me, like, you have to give people hope. Like they have to have something to root for. So I'm very cognizant of working that into my books. <laughs> I think, you know, you're not, that's not exactly what you're saying she said, but I think it's important that there's at least one person in a book that the reader can like. You know, yeah. some person that you can root for. I have I have read books where everyone in it was so unpleasant. Mm -hmm. uh, you just you don't care. You know, you yeah. really don't care what the outcome is. In fact, you'd just be as happy as some mass murder occurred and you know, right. wipe them all out. <laughs> and, and there you would be. And, and sometimes I, you know, sometimes that's the function, interestingly enough, sometimes that's the function of animals. There, you know, sometimes a dog um, mm -hmm. or a cat, but yeah. more often a dog. Um, can do that, you know, that um, I, I did an event with Richard Paul Evans the other day, and it's, it's a Christmas book. So it has to end, you know, in a sort of Christmas hopeful way, but it's, yeah. it's quite a sad story, um, partly autobiographical, but the joy in the book in, in the most meaning comes from the dog, this little dog, you know, that is there to befriend this, mm -hmm. this lonely um, kind of outcast of a boy. Uh -huh. And, um, and I think that maybe that's also, I hadn't thought of this. Maybe that's why we're so adamant that you never kill a dog. Oh my gosh. I can't read books, but, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's kind of a rule, you know, for yeah. writing crime fiction, you can slaughter <laughs> people, you know, you can, you know, you mm -hmm. can take out the deer and the sheep or whatever, but you absolutely can't <laughs> kill off the dog. So, so that's interesting that maybe dogs are Maybe most people associate dogs, not all dogs, but, you know, with some sort of friendly, you know, because dogs love you. I mean, the great thing right. about a dog is that when you come home, there's somebody who's always happy to see you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, too, dogs love you unconditionally. Yeah. So that's. No, that's absolutely true. I think mm -hmm. they do. So going back to Hello Transcriber, uh, since we didn't talk about it. What interested you in in the role of the transcriber? That's a function in a police department. I'm not sure that many of us have thought about. And maybe that was one reason that your book created quite a buzz because people were interested in what the job was. Yeah, I actually, um, I used to be a police transcriber. 
So oh. that was how I got the inspiration for it. But I think, you know, cause I had never heard of that job before until it, until it became my job. So I had no idea what a police transcriber did. I honestly would have thought, you know, a computer would do that job by now. Yeah. Um, because for the most part, you are typing reports. You're listening to, you know, dictation, a detective calling in a report and you put on a headset and press a foot pedal and you hear them and then you just type what they say verbatim. But um, there's a lot more that goes into the job as you find out, like there's very much like processing warrants and arrests and, you know, helping people. It's very much like a support staff job as well. Um, but yeah, so police transcribing was just, it was extremely interesting. It was extremely disorienting. Um, because especially since I worked the night shift, so I would go in at like 10 PM till 6 AM. So when you think about that, I mean, you work an opposite schedule of most people. And so you don't really talk to or see many people very often. And then the only conversations that you hear are very one-sided. It's just somebody telling you a story, um, you know, all night and you're just typing their report for them and just, you know, the things that you would hear. It's like, I had no idea that that was going on two doors down, you know, from where I live and stuff. And then, I don't know, you see the world in a very different way. And I think too, that that kind of plays, I mean, it definitely plays into my fiction, especially with Hello Transcriber. And, you know, since we stuck around in the world of Black Harbor, because it's like, that's all, that was all I was seeing was just the dark and the scary <laughs> so it's like, you know, I became like oversaturated with that. And I was like, well, let's make a world out of this. It's really interesting. Michael Connolly calls that the late show. I don't know if you read his, um, is Renee, his first Renee Ballard book, but she too yeah. worked that shift in the yeah. LA. Was it the, I think it was in the LAPD or maybe it was the Santa Monica. I can't remember. There's so many different police departments around yeah. like greater Los Angeles, but um and one of her answers was to sleep on the beach with a dog. Remember the oh. dog? We just talked about the dog. Um, so she had a dog and, you know, she had a tent. And her way of kind of um, washing out the darkness, the night, mm -hmm. um, the late show, would be to go down and, um, and spend time on the beach with the dog. So I'm sure you're right that, that you know, that's such a different perspective for the world and so much goes on in the dark that it would it really would be an intro a difficult place to dwell for any yeah. length of time right and it's very especially for me too being a transcriber I was you know down the hall down another hall behind a locked door with the blinds closed so it was very like a very isolating job mm -hmm. as well so it's just like, you know, you're just sitting alone in the dark and then listening to these really dark stories. <laughs> what was your qualification for getting the job of transcriber? Yeah, I had to um, take a typing test and a transcribing test. Okay. So I had to, I think you had to type, uh, you had to type 50 words a minute, I think, with like, you know, 98% accuracy. So I can type over 100 words a minute. And then, um, you had to do a, like, listen to something and type it verbatim and get like a hundred percent accuracy. So. Well, yeah, the accuracy part would be really important because it's becoming right. <laughs> part of an official record. It can yeah. be, um, could be heading towards, um, you know, trial if mm -hmm. um, in, in the case of criminal cases or even civil cases, so forth. So yeah, they would depend on the record. I'm wondering with all this emphasis on AI, um, mm -hmm. whether, as you point out, that eventually this would become a robots sort of activity because they would have a higher level of accuracy than, I mean, in terms of just faithfully typing mm -hmm. what is said to them, not necessarily interpreting it. Right. It would certainly be more accurate probably than any person. You would think, I thought, but then when I see the software, and I'm by no means an expert in this kind of software, but when I see the software, um, it's not accurate. <laughs> and it's kind of like, think about like, um, talk to text, like with your phone yeah. and it messes up words sometimes. It's kind of like that. <laughs> oh, they have so to I'm sure, it will, I'm yeah. sure it will, like, it will probably take over soon. 
I'll have to improve it. Autocorrect, in my view, is a real curse. I can hardly yeah. believe how annoying autocorrect can be. <laughs> right. I sometimes think, you know, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm such a amateur with tech. I don't even know if I can turn off autocorrect. I should probably ask my husband <laughs> because I, I find that it, uh, when I, I do the Instagram for the bookstore, I, do, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't do any personal social media because honestly, I don't have time, but I did agree to do the store Instagram, partly because I travel a lot and it's, you know, interesting to put in travel photos. So it's not all, oh, yeah. books. but in writing the captions and so forth, I just, I find that autocorrect could just drive you <laughs> absolutely nuts. Yeah. You have to double check it. <laughs> so the job, um, is what drew Hannah into a case, right? I mean, in the process of transcribing, she clearly must have learned things um, that dragged her into an investigation. But was that a, you know, I thought she was an interesting lead. I guess one reason that I was wondering why you left her, and I understand why maybe she just needs to do her own thing, was <laughs> that it seemed to me she had a fairly obvious job that would pull her into um, police, you know, into actual detection in addition to transcribing. Yeah, that's a, I wanted to have that character like that she has so much separation from her real life, um, you know, working the night shift, but also, you know, swearing like an oath of confidentiality that you can't even talk about what you're working on. So it's like literally you know, because I went through this myself of like everything that, you know, you're not allowed to talk about. And the only people that you can talk to are like um, other, you know, like sworn personnel or people who might be around the police department. So it's very, you're kind of in a, in a bubble. And I wanted somebody who had so much separation from her life and that she's going to be, start becoming obsessive with these cases, especially when, you know, it's it right away in the second chapter where, you know, her neighbor comes up to the window and confesses to hiding a body. So suddenly like that, the separation is gone or there's just kind of an illusion of it. And now she's, you know, torn between really wanting to know what's going on with her neighbor, but, you know, not trying to cross any lines with her job. I mean, of course she's going to cross lines, but that's the fun of it. Well, very true. It would also seem to me that, you know, if you have a job like that, that it, it would be very hard on your personal relationships. I mean, mm -hmm. I was married for a long time to a nuclear scientist and it was a real barrier in that um, there was never, he could never talk about his work mm -hmm. um, and people. So it, it almost created two classes. There were the men who went to, you know, the nuclear fission operation all, and then there were the wives. And the ones who did the best were the wives that um, many of them weren't necessarily college educated or didn't have any other, you know, they were perfectly happy to, you know, mm -hmm. do home, home tending and child raising sure. and the whole bit. I didn't, it didn't work for me. Um, mm -hmm. And eventually I had to leave. But yeah, I, I do recall how difficult it is to have any sort of um, long term relationship yeah if you can't talk about so much of what happened so that would have happened it seems to me to hannah hazel but... sorry hazel <laughs> um i know why i'm fixed on hannah but anyway um yeah so with megan though it's um no morgan it's um i'm having a terrible time with names i fluffed them up oh, it's like, okay like yeah, i'm yeah, really she, sorry she, <laughs> gets more, she gets megan all the time i'm like man i should have named her megan <laughs> no no morgan's a very good name <laughs> um, but Morgan, you know, does she, what ethics does she apply to, to her job? You know, she's going to photograph this family. Does mm -hmm. she have ethical constraints that either they put on her or she puts on herself? Um, I don't know. That's a really good question. Uh, Morgan is very much somebody, I think her, her code of ethics revolves around, keeping her distance um, and keeping people distant from her, um, which is something that I was really interested in using the photography or the camera itself rather as a device right. for that. So Morgan very much, um, she keeps people at arm's length and even, I mean, similar to how we were talking about Hazel and Hello Transcriber with that 
you know, the separation and then suddenly the illusion of separation or isolation. But with Morgan, she, she very much has been um, hurt by people. She has hurt people. So she needs that distance to be there. Um, but she also very much needs the money from the Reynolds family. So she needs this job and she's, uh, she uses her camera as sort of like a barrier, like almost like a window, like, you know, you can't touch me and like, I can't touch you. And it's just the way that she, it's her lens literally for viewing the world of it's like how she sees things, her unique perspective. Um, so just, I think her code of ethics is really around like just kind of keeping people away. <laughs> and well, what about the family that hires her? Because I mean, if she's going to be doing some relatively intimate, um, if not interaction, at least research into their, their mm -hmm. history, what, what was their expectation of her? Did they, did they discuss that with her? Yeah. I mean, it's more just like, you know, I, and that's something that raises questions for Morgan as well of like, you know, I don't really know these people and yet they're inherently trusting me with all of their memories. So that's some, that's a mystery in itself for her that she wants to figure out, like, who are these people? Why are they so interested in me? And, you know, of course I'm going to do this job, but um, they know that she's a recluse and, you know, certain, I think certain family members kind of know that she wants to stay off the grid and wants to stay you know, out of the spotlight. So they're really not too worried about her, you know, unearthing anything. Yeah, it's an interesting, you've, you've picked two really interesting ways for two different women to get into um, <laughs> an investigation. So while they're not classic police procedurals, they mm -hmm. are in, in fact investigations, which mm -hmm. means they, they move forward in a, you know, in a logical way. Um, I do like that. Oh, sorry. I, I like that sort of unconventional lead character in like a police procedural. So, you know, even Hazel and Hello Transcriber, she's somebody who works in the police department, is very close to the cases, but she's not a detective. So for me, I'm like, you know, I'm not a detective. Um, so I would like to read a book that I can relate to. And if I see somebody like Hazel or Morgan, you know, kind of going through the police procedural bit, then I can kind of put myself more in their shoes. Right. And, you know, not so much of, it's a little bit more relatable than escapism for me. Whereas, you know, detectives are, you know, it's super interesting what they're doing, but I can't relate as well because I'm not in that profession. Whereas I think Hazel or Morgan, they're more of like an every woman, you know, where people can get into their heads maybe a little bit easier. Well, I agree with you that I think um, that, you know, if you were going to write it as a as a cop, so to speak, you mm -hmm. would have to have that's that's equivalent to sending um, somebody into a foreign country or a foreign culture. Um, you can you have two ways to do it. You can you can pretend that you're part of that country and the culture. This mm -hmm. comes up in British crime all the time when many British um, there, there can be an objection to Americans writing British crime fiction because they're not <laughs> British and therefore they miss things. So one way around that is to have the sleuth actually come from another country. Yeah. Therefore, they're not completely conversant right. with the culture they've gone into, which is partly what you're doing. But what I was actually referring to is more the structure of, you know, a crime novel um, or at least a police procedural starts with a crime generally and moves towards solving it one way or another. So there's a logic to the way that the story is structured, but there are many other forms of crime fiction that, that are different, you know, they circle right. around in time or we have the whole domestic suspense genre, which depends instead on, um, you know, twists and betrayals and you never can trust anything. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a mind that seems to adapt better to what you're writing in the sense that I like, I like the structure of the mm -hmm. unfolding investigation and to see if I can figure out what's going on. Oh, good. I like that too. I mean, I think that's, you know, probably because that's what I like reading. So that's what yeah. I like writing. Um, but yeah, I love that. That's sort of, 
natural unfolding and unraveling things. And even as you're writing it, there's things that surprise you. And then, you know, you might make a mental note to go in, um, you know, add something in or add a clue or, you know, later, which is, which is really fun. I like kind of, you know, dropping hints or like little Easter eggs or pieces. So people can kind of, it's almost like you're reading the book and like going along and sort of collecting these clues and seeing how do they all fit. Cause I, I do that when I'm writing sometimes too, where I'm like, okay, there's a key. What's it for? Okay. I don't know. I guess we're going to find out. <laughs> so do you, do you know when you start where you're going or, you know, in, in this, how you got there, that's surprising or is the entire thing surprising? Um, it's usually, I think I have, it's like, I think I know where I'm going and then I end up going off road and take a detour <laughs> and discovering a lot of new things. Um, the Widowmaker was definitely a book that I thought I knew where I was going and I, I absolutely was surprised. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of where, I, it's funny that I actually ended up in the same place I meant to. So the ending pretty much was, you know, where I always had initially planned, but getting there was not the way that I expected to. <laughs> That sounds like a good, you know, I mean, I'm always, there, there are pantsers who say they have no idea where they're going. They have no idea who's doing mm -hmm. what at all. Um, and I've always thought that was, that was really kind of difficult for me to conceive because my mind doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. But I <laughs> certainly can understand if you start at A and way down the road, you know, there's mm -hmm. the end game, how you get there can't yeah. be all full of, you know, surprises and detours. Well, and I, I'm not mad when that happens either, because, you know, it's like, yes, you are taking the scenic route, but even like it worked out so well for me in the Widowmaker, because, you know, even if I thought, you know, Joe Schmo did it, then I'm writing it that way as if Joe Schmo did it. And then I find out, no, it wasn't this person. It was so-and-so. Now I've planted red herrings, not meaning to. So now you have those twists already built in and I'm like, and it feels organic and authentic because I really believed that. <laughs> and now I need to go and like cover my tracks and, you know, stitch it in enough, like, you know, that it's fair that, you know, it becomes this other person who actually did it. But yeah, the, the Widowmaker was one, I think it was really like the 11th hour that I had like that aha moment. And I called my editor, Leslie, like the next morning and I was like, I figured it out. It's this for all these reasons. And she's like, I knew you would get there. <laughs> what, what was your background, um, you know, for writing novels? Was, was Hello Transcriber your first novel or was it the first published novel? First published novel. So I went to, um, I always knew I wanted to write novels. So I went to um, college at UW-Madison and I did their English and creative writing program. And um, then, you know, you, you don't just get a degree writing novels and get a job writing novels, you know, so I ended up hopping around to bookstores, which was great. Um, and I used to drive because, you know, it's I, I'm from up north, so there's not a lot of places like to work up there. I used to drive 100 miles a day round trip to go work at Barnes and Noble. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And um yeah, I used to write fantasy. I thought like fantasy was going to be it for me. I used to read a ton of fantasy and yeah, I mean, it really wasn't, it wasn't panning out, but I think, you know, it's kind of like we were talking about, like even plotting a novel, it's like, you think you know where you're going and then you don't, or it turns out differently. It's like, I thought that I was going to be an author who wrote fantasy novels and I'm absolutely not, but I think it really helped with my world building and, you know, why I'm able to, you know, create kind of these like, uh, like vivid, detailed, atmospheric settings, because in fantasy, you have to make everything up. So, and you have to be very, you know, nobody has been to this world before. So you really need to, you know, make it come alive for people in a place that they can navigate. So I'm not mad about the fact that I started out writing fantasy and it really didn't pan out. And it wasn't until I got to the police department as a transcriber that I, I still wanted to be a novelist, but I knew I'm like, whatever you're doing isn't working. So just chill out a little bit, 
put these projects aside and just see sort of what comes to mind. And it was listening to all of these reports and just sort of stepping outside of yourself and be like, you work in the dark, you listen to detectives all night, tell you all the gritty secrets that are going on. And like, this might be interesting for a book. <laughs> so where did you, you know, Minotaur, your publisher runs mm -hmm. several contests and I can't remember looking back, did you enter one of their contests or did you go a more conventional route getting an agent and and then they they bought one? I mean, hardly any publisher accepts trans, you know, manuscripts over the door anymore. That's oh, yeah. completely yeah. out of date. I I knew that I needed a literary agent. So um yeah, when I got Hello Transcriber to what I thought was, you know, the best, the, the best manuscript that I could write, um, I started querying literary agents you know, like the old school way with the, the query letter. And um, I mean, it was months and months of querying, but I, yeah, I found my agent. She found me out of the slush pile and I, I actually saw her. Um, it was her ma manuscript wish list was how I found her. Wow. And yeah. And she, some of the things that she said on there were so spot on, like she's from the Midwest as well. And she, um, she also used to work at Barnes and Noble. And I was like, you know, when you're querying agents, especially a cold query, if you don't have any books under your belt, it's like you almost look for anything that you have in common, like any kind of connection. So I was like, she's from the Midwest. She also is a Barnes and Noble bookseller. And the things that she was looking for were just, you know, she was looking for that more like sort of literary, not literary fiction, all of it, but she's like, she likes that literary prose and she she had something that she said that really I was like, this is this is her. I know that's my agent because she said, like, I um, she's like, I'll, I'll never represent the hard drinking, hard boiled detective novel. And I was like, that's absolutely not what I want to write. So I want I want that genre, but I want to do something different with it. And yeah, she ended up she was my agent and it's wonderful. And she got me. You know, she she submitted to like several different places, but yeah, Minotaur actually when with Leslie, it was on submission for a little bit. And I mean, it was crazy. I was like, you know, doing, I was traveling around the country for work at the time. And, you know, it, my manuscript was on submission and I kept seeing these kind of rejections come in and it's like, uh, it can be really disheartening, you know, but I was reading the rejection, some of them that provided feedback and it was kind of, there were common threads to the feedback. And there was one specifically from St. Martin's press. And she had said, you know, um, just, she's like, right now it's like 70% literary and 30% suspense. Like it should be flipped. And if you did this and that, and this and that, you know, you could revise and resubmit. And so I was like, I think she's right. And, you know, my, my agent did caution me. She's like, don't rewrite it just for one person, because if you do that and, and they still don't want it, now you have a different manuscript, which I, I completely agree with her. Um, but it was just like seeing all the other feedback that I was like, I do think that this is the right call. So I had, I had her pull it from submissions. I rewrote it while I was like flying on airplanes to this for this work trip, spent 13 hours on it. And then I got back and none of my changes saved. So oh, no. I, none of them saved. <laughs> oh, so I put my head down on my desk and I cried for five minutes. And then I just started again. I was like, well, I, you knew what you were doing. So yeah, I started again. We revised and resubmitted. And then it was Leslie from St. Martin's Press Minotaur and she bought it. So it all worked out. You know, perseverance is a great deal to do with <laughs> who gets published, but how wise of you to, you know, sometimes people, sometimes new authors or any author sometimes, um, are just just don't want to change their, their manuscript. Mm -hmm. And I understand that, you know, but at the same time, if you really want to get published and you're having a constructive mm -hmm. kind of a dialogue, although it, listening to it, obviously in your case, worked out well. Yeah. And I, I will say, I do think that, um, you know, as much as like college can't really prepare you for writing a novel, especially 
people have their own styles. Like we have to develop our own voices, our own styles, what we want to write about. So, but I think that like what college really prepared me well for was my creative writing workshops was critique. So we would write short stories usually and you would get critiqued and it was, it like being able to accept constructive criticism is a skill set that people yes, need to hone. And, and sometimes, you know, it's sort of blocking out the noise of who's talking just to talk or who's, you know, putting you down to make themselves feel better. But, and then looking at people like who really do have your best interest at heart and listening to like kind of a select few people. And also, you know, having had four, you know, four manuscripts that I had tried getting an agent for and like never really went anywhere. You just have to sit down and think you're like, for years, all I have wanted is for somebody to tell me what to do, how to fix it, how to make this a good book. And I'm like, this person is telling you what to do, like, just do it. So you know, there's not every, you need a sympathetic relationship and you, you know, it, it means you have to find the right editor or the editor has to find the right author. Some mm -hmm. are just a complete mismatch. I mean, I've been doing this for over 33 years now, and I have seen, you know, the damage that a bad match between an editor and an author or an agent and an author for that matter, because agents mm -hmm. do a lot of early editing. You can see the damage that can result. Um, so, you know, sometimes changing editors or, you know, this is a good thing, mm -hmm. um, particularly if your own work changes. So let me ask you this final question before we get Patrick, what are you working on now? You've done two books about Black Harbor with two different women. Mm -hmm. um, so what is it you're working on? I'm assuming you're working on another novel. Oh yeah, um, actually, so there is a third Black Harbor novel ah. and that will feature new protagonists. <laughs> so I like, um, I do like very much working, you know, in Black Harbor, the same world, but taking these characters who we've seen from other books and maybe they were a supporting character and now, you know, they're the main character. So. Um, even in Hello Transcriber, you know, Detective Nikolai Cole returns in The Widowmaker, where he was, you know, very much a practically a main character. He was a main character in Hello Transcriber, and now he's in The Widowmaker as a supporting character, and he's back in the third one. But um, you know, I, I think it's it's fun when I take so the the third book, uh, the main character is a medical examiner. And so her name is only mentioned in Hello Transcriber in a report. In The Widowmaker, she makes a cameo. She pops up in like the first and the second chapter. And now in the third book, she's the main character. So I like when we can, you know, kind of follow people like throughout their careers or, you know, have somebody who was in the background and now we get to dial in on them. So there's a third Black Harbor novel that I'm almost, well, it's done. I just have to do copy edits and proofread. Um, so it's scheduled for fall of 2023, which I really hope it does come out in fall because um, it takes place over Halloween. So that would be great. <laughs> that would be very nice. Well, yeah, you know, um, so you're you're always following women. You, you don't feel that, you know, you want to pluck a man out of some place in Black Harbor and make him the lead? Yeah, I would love to. Um, well, and actually in The Widowmaker, so Morgan, it, it alternates points of view between Morgan and Hudson. Right. So, um, and actually I used to, I thought Hudson was the main character of the Widowmaker. And it's, it's funny. Like you wouldn't think that, you know, people who've written, you know, how many manuscripts have trouble starting, but I, I get bogged down with kind of the technical stuff of like, what tense am I writing in? And you know, who's my main character who starts. And I was like, Hudson's the main character. And I read a blog. I was like, start the first chapter starts with your main character I was like easy enough Hudson it is and my editor read it and she's like you started in the wrong place you should start with Morgan I was like but I read this blog and it said you should start with your main character and she's like yeah Morgan's your main character <laughs> I was like huh. well, oh, okay. but you that's really good because you do have an editor that really understands you know your writing and um and you know how you how you work so good for her Patrick, much, come yeah. join us and see if we have any <laughs> questions from the audience
Hi there. Um, yeah, there are a few questions that have come in. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay, Diane would like to know, uh, what did you like to read when you were growing up? Oh, great question. My favorite book growing up and still is Jurassic Park. <laughs> so I do love, um, I love speculative fiction. Um, so yeah, my favorite my favorite book to read growing up was Jurassic Park. I was always reading very, very probably older books than I should have been. Um, I read like the Outlander series in high school. I loved it because, you know, it kind of has the, the fantasy elements a little bit, sort of that magical realism and the, the Scottish Highlands. So yeah, I absolutely loved the Outlander series. Very much um, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. So I was all over the place. Honestly, I could count on one hand how many thrillers I read before I started writing thrillers. <laughs> what made you decide to want to write thrillers instead of uh, epic fantasy or? Yeah, I, no, that's a really good question because it's what I think writing, especially when you're writing to get published, requires a lot of reflection. And, you know, you have to, as much as a rejection hurts, like you should read them because sometimes people give you morsels of insight that when you put them all together, they're really valuable. And what I was seeing in common feedback, even from agents who would respond to me with a rejection were say, I just can't connect to the main character. And I thought maybe they're not connecting with the main character because I'm not connecting with the main character. So that's why with Hello Transcriber, I was like, we are going full on, write what you know. So I am a police transcriber. My character is now a police transcriber. <laughs> and I don't know, how do you write a, maybe somebody will do it. How do you write a different genre besides crime fiction when your character is a police transcriber? <laughs> <laughs> Great, horror. Create a different right, horror. horror. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Or in an alternate alternate world, something like right. that. <laughs> right. Um, let's see here. What else do we have? Um, let's see. Are you doing any touring for this book? I know you've stayed, you've done a few live events already, but are you going mm -hmm. on the road? Yeah. Um, I've done a few in Wisconsin already. I'm excited. I get to go up north tomorrow to my, a bunch of my family um, at an indie bookstore in Green Bay. And I'm actually going to uh, Murder by the Book in Houston, um, joining Stacy Willingham, who wrote Flicker in the Dark. That was like the big book last year. So I'm um, joining Stacy Willingham at Murder by the Book on January 14th. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Can you talk a little bit about just about your daily writing habit? Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a, a certain process that you follow? Or are there you know, a certain number of words you're shooting for each day. How do you get the work done? Yeah, that is, um, it depends on what stage of the manuscript I'm in. Um, but it is pretty regimented depending on the stage. So, and I have my, my schedule is very um, dialed in. I love writing between like five and 9 a.m. usually. So I, I'm like, I need to feel like I'm getting away with something. And I feel like 5 a.m. is like stolen hours that like, you're not supposed to be up. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to be awake. Nobody's going to be bothering me. I'm, I don't have to be anywhere. I don't have to be logged on to anything. So I love writing in that like dark twilight hours around like 5 a.m. is my favorite. And if I am like drafting something, and you, I just really want to get that first draft down, then I shoot for uh, a thousand words a day and a thousand words a day, Monday through Friday, I take off on Saturdays and then I write 2000 words on Sundays. Wow. So you're not really taking Saturday off. No, I read on Saturday. It into Sunday. Yeah. But then I find that I'm like, you know, really like energized and productive. I used to write every single day, like no days off. Um, but I find that, I don't know if it's like so much burnout, but I'm fresher when I come back on Sundays and I'm happy to write 2000 words. So that's just what works for me. But I do think um, setting a word count is something that I avoided for a very long time. And again, if you, if you want to be like a published writer, then 
you, you should probably be efficient at it <laughs> or try to be efficient. <laughs> so tell us about the, the poster board behind you. Is that a novel in progress? Is that story? Oh, yeah. board? That's my murder board. So um, yeah, actually the, the Widowmaker is the book that necessitated the murder board um, because there's, we meet quite a few characters pretty early on in the Widowmaker. And I was like, concepting this novel, I was like, oh my gosh, like there's a bunch of people and I know they connect, but how do they connect? And some of them connect in multiple ways. So I was like, I need one of those boards that they have in a detective bureau like the whiteboard with the pictures on it and the string and they connect people. And so I, it's evolved since it used to be like kind of a wallpaper, a dry erase board wallpaper. So now it's actually dry erase board paint and it's like seven feet long, like four feet high. And I print out my characters reference photos and then I write them little bios and draw how they connect to each other. And the people in black and white images are dead or I'm going to kill them at some point. <laughs> so it's a it's an interesting conversation topic like when I hop on a a zoom call for work or something they're like what's that I'm like oh <laughs> don't worry about that <laughs> now will that get wiped clean here for a new for your next book yeah actually this is my my next one that I'm working on it's like my secret okay. project um I have not pitched it yet to my publisher but it's very it's not a black harbor novel it's very different and I don't know I'm having so much fun writing it so I really hope it's something that they want I got the green light from my agent um she's bought in she's like do it write it so I'm, I'm hoping to pitch it after the new year what can you tell us a little bit without giving too much away is it something something different about it or a different element um yeah it's I love the Midwest and like we we were talking about kind of like the ghosts of industry, those kinds of cities. So I, I'm going to be returning to one of those actually in Milwaukee. And um, I'm very much enchanted by the haunted atmosphere of Milwaukee. And I would like to go back in time to 1994 and have um, my character who's um, a process server. So somebody who very much looks at himself as kind of a grim reaper because um, nobody wants to see the process server showing up at their door with a subpoena for a court notice or an eviction or a divorce petition or something. So that's where we're headed with that one. So I'm, I don't know, it's very different. And as Barbara was asking before, are you ever gonna do like a male lead character? Like this is my male lead character. So I don't know, I, I love it so far. I hope it can go somewhere. <laughs> So 1994. Do, and that's, that's another another interesting, you know, there's so many different, I don't want to say career, but there's so many different aspects to the legal system. Yeah. And I like the way that you've found, you know, these unusual, like oh, thank the you. Driver, <laughs> but a process server is, you know, um, mm -hmm. not, not so easily thought of as like a detective. So right. well, it's much less glamorous. <laughs> yeah, but it can be really dangerous. Yeah, it can be. No, I mean, you know, that's even like sort of a, a dark humor joke in the book. You know, people like to shoot the messenger. So yeah. Right. <laughs> anything else, Patrick? Yeah, there's a question from Mark. He would like to know, um, have you had any offers for TV, TV series or movies? Not yet, but maybe there's one in my inbox now. <laughs> Good idea. Think positively yeah. about it. Manifest, right. yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. Yeah. If somebody points out about fantasy, that fantasy involves so much world building, do you find that especially difficult? Oh, um, yeah, I don't know if I'd say difficult. I think it presents challenges, but I don't know. I really, I really love the world building aspect. And I think, you know, if you do it, if you do it right and if you allow yourself enough freedom, you know, for your characters to to play and navigate and for you to, you know, I it's your world. So it needs to it needs to serve the purpose of your book. So that's like what's so fun about it is because you you can control everything, but like you better 
you better make sure you understand how that world works because yeah. people will call you out on that if it's inconsistent. <laughs> or if it's not convincing. It does have right. to be. Yes. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. It does have to be convincing. Yeah. I kind of like the idea of um, you know of what you're doing with um, a, a different kind of lead. Uh, it's, it really is an extended ensemble cast. It sounds mm -hmm. like so. It, you know, one particular character is just taking the taking center stage for each book, and there there have been others series like that. Barbara, remember the uh, Ed McBain did something like that with uh, absolutely. No, yeah, he did. So did Del Shannon a long, long time ago, but. Um, yeah, there are there are indeed series where the not as, not as many because uh, people want to grab onto a protagonist, but um, yeah, um, Tana French does that with her Dublin Murder Squad series. Right. And I yeah, I loved like how that was set up. I you know I feel like like everybody I want Rob Ryan to come back so badly, but it's so fun just to see other characters in this Murder Squad, like you said, sort of take center stage, yeah. but. I think that's very true. Um, I, there's no reason why a culture or a city, um, you know, can't be the anchor rather yeah. than um, a lead character, and, and because you know, in really in really compelling books, I think that the the landscape of the book is just as interesting as the people, or at least for me, it is. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. I find that people are drawn to reading books because of the place or the mm -hmm. culture, um, rather than you know a particular person. So mm -hmm. you become invested in characters, but then there's also the whole thing. Well, what happens, you know, it's not a guarantee that this character is going to live to see the next book That's you know, true. With, a, with a series, you know, that the hero is going to survive mm -hmm. to the next book, but. And the dog. Yeah. Hopefully, and the dog. <laughs> hopefully the dog. And definitely yeah, the dog. <laughs> right. Well, Hannah, it's really been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, oh, yeah. So thank you. I've very much enjoyed it. The Widowmaker, we do have autographed copies. Um, Hello Transcriber is now out in paperback, so if you haven't had a chance to read it, you now can. Anyway, um, happy holidays to everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Bye. Thank you, guys. Congrats. Thanks. Take care now. Bye.